Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 177 of the Strength Coach Podcast, the official podcast of Michael Boyle, strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information. Remember, you can try strengthcoach.com out for three days for just a buck. And if you have a staff of two or more and you want to sign up as a group, we have a special membership offer for you, up to 50% off, depending on how many people you got. Check it out at strengthcoach.com. All right, I'm your host, Anthony Renna, and the show notes are located at strengthcoachpodcast.com. Want to get in touch with me, shoot me an email to strengthcoachpodcast at gmail.com. All right, today on the Coach's Corner, I spoke to Coach Poyle about an in-service that Anna Hartman from movementrev.com did at MBSC on being in tune with your body. She also wrote an article to accompany that that we posted on strengthcoach.com. And Coach Poyle thinks this is a game changer, so I'm going to talk to him all about that. I actually uh, inspired me to have Anna on, so I have her on for the Hit the Gym with a Strength Coach segment on, and we're going to talk about resting postures, the cool down, introducing a more sensory environment to our feet, and much more. So that's coming up on the Coach's Corner and the Hit the Gym with a Strength Coach segment. For the ASC Equipment Experts with Perform Better, I have Erin McGurr. She joins us to talk about the holiday sale and the new DC blocks. For the Results Fitness University Business to Fitness segment, Alan Cosgrove is on to talk about evolving for the Art of Coaching with Exos, Kier Wenham Flat is on to start a three-part series on the three pillars of physical preparation for rugby. Today, he talks about the neuromuscular system. And for the Functional Movement System segment, Frank Dolan continues his series on a review of all seven screens for the FMS. Today, he talks about the inline lunge. Lots of things to get to you, so let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, now it's time for the Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle. Coach, how are you doing? Once again, Anthony, I am doing great for about the 165th consecutive time. No, 100, what are we, 170? 177. 177, yeah. Yeah, 177th consecutive time. I'm doing great. I've answered that question the same way 177 times. <laughs> nice. Coach, let's get into it. I know you don't have a lot of time, but I do. We'll probably spend the whole time talking about this one topic. Anna Hartman came in and she did an in-service at MBSC. Um, you guys put it up on Body by Boyle online, also on strengthcoach.com. We, uh, we posted basically, and uh, one of our articles, a summary of that, um, of that, um, of that lecture, uh, and that is how in tune is your body. And uh, she posted about 12 videos from the different resting postures. First, let's get a summary of... Uh, Anna's talk from you. So Anna's talk, um, it's really interesting. So the work, the original work is a guy named Philip Beach, who uh, I believe is an osteopath from New Zealand. Really interesting. And it actually starts around embryology and evolution. And it's, it's pretty dense stuff. But it kind of busts out into this simple idea. She said a couple of things in her talk that were really simple and resonant. And one was basically, <clears throat> excuse me, that beach doesn't feel like the body recognizes rest. Like we're not at rest until we've gone into some of these rest postures. And I guess you could, and maybe I'm putting words in his mouth, but what I got out of it was that because we sit in chairs, because we sit in our car, because we sit on the sofa, we never get back into these, kind of deeply ingrained ancient postures and patterns that our body really recognizes as rest. And those were a lot of what the videos were. And the thing we were talking about saying is tapping. Everyone's going, oh, it's yoga. Actually, it's not yoga because it was before yoga. They show like these aborigines in the posture on his website, and I'm sure they weren't at yoga. But um, so that's just my shot. Carolyn, if you're listening, um, my shot <laughs> at yoga out there. But <laughs> um yeah, you gotta get the you gotta get the private jokes in Anthony as well as the public jokes sometimes as you go okay, along. You go. But um, so, but what it does actually, I gotta finish my article now. She put a little pressure on me because she ripped that one up so fast. So I wrote one that I'm titling a case for cool down, and I think we talked about this a little bit the other day on the podcast too. 
I've never been a big cool down guy, and I've probably sort of maybe even had some negative things to say about cool down at different times, waste of time. But this made me really rethink it. The other thing that made me really rethink it is that I tried to get into some of these postures that she shows, and I was to say not very good might be giving me too much credit. <laughs> <laughs> The, the vast majority, if you start looking and you read the article, the idea of like a five is you could sit like that for 20 minutes. Yeah, no way. Um, I think it was basically lying on my back and lying on my side with the two that I would have gotten fives on. And a lot of the rest uh, would have been uh, not so much. Some like one can't even get in the position. Others pretty uncomfortable. But it also ties into other things that we're doing in terms of ankle mobility and hip mobility. So in some ways, it's very respectful of this joint-by-joint joint idea that has become obviously something that's sort of tied into everything that we do. So it, it was just, and this, my, I think I said to you right away when they, that I thought that this was a real game-changing talk. So this leads into also our winter seminar is going to be January 16th. We're going to do the winter seminar again. The boys, Marco and uh, Kevin had been really pushing to do a winter seminar again, so we found a date that wouldn't conflict with Perform Better and some other things. And Anna is going to be our speaker, so nice. that people will get a chance to kind of come in and, and hear this a little bit from the horse's mouth and get a chance to, to try some of it. So um, I think, to me, that this and the PRI stuff have been the two really big game changers over, the, say, the last five years for me. In terms of looking at something and saying, wow, this really makes a case for me or for us altering our program. And we have. We've put, we're put we practicing these postures. We're using them as warm-up and cool-down right now just to get people used to doing them. So yeah. some of our stretching. The other yeah. thing that Kevin Card made a really good point was that it ties in very much to the Astina stuff. And what you start to see, and this is even more interesting, you said we're going to talk about this all the time, and of course I'm, I'm in soliloquy mode today after coming out of the staff meeting, but um, when you look at his book, so the foreword to Beach's book was written by Leon Chato, so obviously really smart guy, really you know, a preeminent sort of mind in the field, and then one of the quotes on the jacket is from Thomas Byers. So you start thinking, there's some other smart people here who are having to think that this guy's onto something. And so, it, you know, it's, uh, it's just really interesting. And the, the bad part of what I'm going to try to do is what I usually do in my talk at Report Better on December 12th. I'm going to talk a little bit about this. And in the article, the upcoming uh, case for cool down, I think the key is to simplify it because he uses words like archetype and repose. And you know, a lot of these, you're like, what is he talking about? And, Obviously, you know, archetype is what they said, you know, the, the original. So he's talking about these original postures, and then repose is rest. So he's really talking about original fundamental resting postures, sitting cross-legged, which people might view as Indian style, sitting foot to foot, which people would probably call Taylor sitting, half lotus, um, sitting in a squat, in some of these positions. But you realize that even for somebody like me, I would look at it and say, I have really good mobility for a 56-year-old guy, and I really can't do a lot of this stuff. Sitting on my heels, I can't do. It's very uncomfortable. The toe sitting, if you haven't tried, try toe sitting today. If you look at the videos and you try toe sitting, it legitimately feels to me as if someone is trying to rip the big toes off of my feet. Coach, rem remind us, which one was the toe sitting? Toe sitting is, well, it's, you're sitting back on your heels, but your toes are on the ground. Yeah. So in sort of the heel sitting, your feet are extended. So your, your plants are flexed in the toe sitting, your dorsum flexed and your, your toes are bent and you're sitting back. And that was one of the ones that she recommended. If you go back, there's a thread about, think about ankle mobility. Yeah. And pinch, a lot of this stuff pinch really ankle came mobility. Up there. Yeah. yeah. Pinch ankle mobility. So that's where this originally came from. And then I had already scheduled Anna to come out and talk. And when she said, what should I talk about? I'm like, talk about those ankle, like, like what's up with this ankle mobility stuff that you're doing? Where did this come from? And so that led us into this whole uh, Philip Beach talk and the, you know, the embryology. And, and in some ways, it's way too complicated. 
But as I said, I'm really looking at this. How do we simplify it? How do we make it useful? And that's kind of where we're at right now. And it makes us realize, okay, we need a little cool down period. The nice thing about cool down is it's easy because all you got to say to people is they want to sit on their butt anyway. Say after the assault bike or one of those things. And we're going to give them that opportunity to sit on their butt and say, okay, every 30 or every 40 seconds, I want you to change your position. And yeah. that's, as I said, I can do it myself. And, and then there's another whole, the walking on rocks thing. There's some barefoot stuff in there too. There's, there's some other stuff that's going on, but I've been doing the walking more barefoot, more work on the rocks to stimulate the bottoms of your feet, which share the same nervous feed with your lumbar stabilizers. And for whatever reason, my back feels better and I'm sleeping better. And those to me are really significant changes when I look at there's only one thing or two things that I've been doing different. I've been in these resting postures more and I've been walking on the rocks a little bit more. So, yeah, and I, cool I, don't, I think, yeah, maybe the books are complicated, but uh, Anna's talk was real. I mean, or especially the article, it's pretty simple. I mean, here's the 12 positions. It's not rocket science. They're all relatively easy positions to get into. They're just hard to stay in. I mean, for me, right. the toe sitting and the heel sitting, I've been doing for a while anyway, but not to this extreme. I just would do them as almost like before a workout and not for any time. But then when you start to sit there and think, can you do it for 20 minutes? There's absolutely no way. But, uh, you know, Anna also has some recommendations on kind of using pillows, et cetera. But it's pretty easy. There's 12 videos. You know, can you hold them for 20, mi 20 minutes? Yes or no? That's part of it. And then um, I like the fact that she uh, just, you know, made it pretty simple with her, uh, you know, the 12 points in, uh uh, point uh, grading system and then um, but it it's all pretty easy the way she puts it it's just yeah can you do it and coach uh, you would do them for cool down but would you add them to maybe a tri set or a quad set I guess you could I, for us I decided to put them in the warm up so that we could practice them yeah as a group so you could get people because there is a little bit it's funny I think anytime you change you always have the why are we changing why are we doing different things and so yeah. when you're in that kind of warm up, I always think like sitting in the group or sitting in a circle, you can kind of explain to people what you're thinking. And so a lot of times we have some really good conversations because especially with sort of my high level athletes, my Olympic girls, baseball guys, they're curious. Some people, yeah. I think the kids that we train don't really care. Like, I just want to work out. I don't care what we do. You're in charge. Let's just do it. But, yeah. Some of the other athletes really like to understand. And I like to talk to them about it because I want them to think about, hey, is it impacting your sleep? Does your back feel better? Are there, are there things going on? Like for me, I was very concerned about the placebo effect. Of, am I just feeling this because I want to? Or am I feeling this because it's really happening? And I'm 100% today, I'm 100% convinced it's really happening because again, today my alarm woke me up. It is extremely unusual for me to get woken up by an alarm clock. And yet, mm -hmm. since I've started playing around with some of this stuff, I've been woken up more by my alarm clock, and I've slept for longer periods of time. And it goes back to this Beach's idea of the body not recognizing. Because I guess so what I took out of it from listening to Anna is thinking about this idea that, wow, maybe the body doesn't know the workout's over. Because as she said, you know, you go through this whole hard workout, then you go and you jump in your car in this yeah. relatively unfamiliar evolutionary position, sitting. And so you kind of think, gee, you know, if I, if I take some time and sort of give the body, like, the last signal, all right, here's the last signal. I'm in these, these restful postures that I would recognize from millions of years of evolution as being rest. That's a pretty interesting point, I think, that you really need to kind of wrap your head around. Yeah. It's, it's good yeah. stuff. And I think what I really liked about it was so easy to – this is an easy homework 
assignment for clients as well. It's very just yep. to say, hey, pick three or four of these, pick whatever, you know, go home and do these and uh, do them for 30 seconds each, you know, two minutes out of your time, whatever, um, that I think it's it's going to be a really easy homework uh, assignment. So good stuff. I'll remind everybody, the article is called How In Tune Is Your Body? It's worth it. Just to sign up to com for a dollar for the three-day trial. Get, <laughs> read the article. And if you don't like the rest of the stuff going on, you can cancel. But Coach, we, we are certainly going to talk more about this, but uh, I will let you go. Thanks for coming on, and we'll talk to you next time. All right. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Now it's time for the Ask the Equipments with Perform Better, and I am here with the lovely and talented Aaron McGurr. Aaron, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. All right, my favorite time of year when the little Santa hat gets onto the uh, little man on Perform Better logo. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's just remind everybody, talk to us about your holiday sale. Our holiday sale is going on right now. Uh, I love the little Perform Better guy with the with the Christmas hat. That's probably my favorite time. Every time I see it, I just start laughing, but I'm a child, so, you know, that's fine. Um, the holiday sale, you can save up to 40% on certain items, and we're also having free shipping on orders over $49 on select items as well. So some of the things we do have on the holiday holiday sale qualify for both. So we have our PB Extreme weight vests, foam rollers, super bands, cook bands, ultimate sandbags, jam balls, things like that where you're not only getting a discount, but if your order is over $49, you'll still receive free shipping on those items as well. And then we do have some more expensive, high-ticket items on sale, which is really nice to see. So our foam plyo boxes, our Olympic hex bars, half racks, adjustable benches, things like that, those are on sale as well. Unfortunately, they don't qualify for free shipping, but... Um, the sale prices are really good on those. So if you have someone that you really care about in the fitness industry, I think it would make a great gift, but that's just me. I mean, if anyone wants to get me a gift, I'm all for it. <laughs> all right. Well, if anyone wants to get me a gift for these next this next item, I saw I was looking at the <laughs> new product section, um, and you got these DC blocks, and you're going to explain to them in, in a minute. But... Um, you know, we're going to have you compare them to the PB Extreme hang clean stands. And one of the things for me personally is because of my clientele, although every single person in here does do a hip hinge deadlift, uh, like more of a Romanian deadlift, um, this, and I would love to get the, the hang clean stands. I just, cause you know, just cause if they, if they can't do it off the floor in the beginning, um, I just feel like it's kind of like a one trick pony, like, because you can't adjust them, but these new DC blocks, um, although maybe a little bit more expensive, they're definitely, uh, at least they're adjustable and, uh, give you some room to work with it. Tell us about these two products. Well, like you said, the DC blocks are something new that we started carrying. Our new catalogs for 2016 did go out in the mail, so hopefully people are receiving them. And on the website, we do have them under our new products page. And what it is, like you said, we're going to compare them to the first place hang clean stands. Both of those are good for spotting Olympic bar takeoffs and landings, um, allowing lifters to put their body and in, in the bar in the correct position when you're, you know, doing repeats for trying to get force and velocity and things like that on your Olympic lifts. So like you said, the hang clean stands, they're steel. So it's got the lips in the front, so you can't have the bar roll off. Um, it is a 12-inch height that the bar starts at, which is really where... It would, it's good for lifting from the knees, um, but other than that, like you said, you're kind of limited. We actually found out about the DC box from some of our customers who were looking for them. Um, we have heard of them before, but we kind of never got into it because we didn't know how many people were actually um, getting into more serious Olympic lifting, which what I think is it's really good for those people that are really trying to progress their lifters, like you said, not just from one standpoint, but from really moving along in the different spots of an Olympic lift. So they're sold in pairs, and they're actually, it's a machine-molded recycled plastic. So they won't chip, they won't break or crack or rust. Um, and they actually have an interlocking design, so you stack them kind of like adult Legos, I guess, would be a good way to put it. Um, but you can stack them just so you can improve your Olympic lifting technique. So 
you can use the blocks to help develop more power. You can, um, like I said earlier, starting from the knees is about 12 inches on each side, and each block is two inches, so you would need a couple of them. So in order to even get to the hang clean stand height, you would need about six pairs of them. Um, so it's about double the price. The the best part, though, besides the price, I know I know it's high, but um, you can increase as you go. So you know you can add some here and there. So say you're progressing your lifter and you're going to do lifting from the snatch power position for athletes that are taller or work on, you know, your jerk pulls from higher up, you can add to what you have and kind of progress from there. So the more you keep stacking, obviously the different positions you can get for your athletes, um, just working on the different power positions of your pulls. So in that aspect, it is a lot different from the first place hang clean stands because you can progress that way. Um, they weigh about 10 pounds each, so they're not going to tip over. They're not lightweight. But, I mean, it's it's something cool that we added. I think it's going to kind of change the way a lot of people start to do some of their lifting. Um, so I'm looking forward to see how they do. All right. Very cool. Very cool. They are on the wish list. So, E, thank you so much for coming on today, talking about the Perform Better Holiday Sale, the big, the huge holiday sale and the uh, the DC block so thanks again and we will talk to you next time thanks for having me hi there welcome to the art of coaching with exos my name is Keir Wenham Flat and I'm the exos strength and conditioning coach responsible for the preparation of the Argentinian national rugby union team we've recently just finished the rugby world cup where we were lucky enough to finish fourth and over the next three installments of The Art of Coaching, I'm going to be sharing with you the three pillars of the program of physical preparation that underpin what we do with the Argentinian team. Now, getting into uh, philosophy, I think it's really, really important to outline the final destination or the ultimate goal of the program. Just like any journey in the real world, uh, we know that the, the most efficient, fastest journey is from point A to point B is a straight line. But in order to achieve that, we need to know what the final destination is. The same is true of training. Once you know what the final destination or goal of the program is, that will inform every step that you take working backwards from there to take you from where you are to where you want to be as a team. And at the most simplistic level, the goal of our program is speed of movement. This is an idea stolen from um, more Eastern Bloc and, and Soviet strength and conditioning coaches. But basically, all things being equal, if we can increase the speed of movement with which our athletes are moving and executing sporting skill, uh, we're going to equip ourselves with the greatest possible chances of success from a physical perspective. Obviously, if we run and we're moving faster, we're going to be moving faster. If we're moving faster when we're evading opponents, we're going to hopefully uh, evade that tackle or move into space more effectively. Um, when we move faster, when we're jumping, we jump higher. Uh, and also when we move faster going into contact situations like a ruck, uh, a maul or a tackle, we're going to be driving into that situation with more force and hopefully uh, winning that contact situation against the opposition player. And there are three primary areas that we're looking to enhance in order to achieve this increase in the speed of movement. One is the central nervous system. Two is the neuromuscular system and the third is the metabolic system. And today in part one, we're going to be talking about how it is that we train uh, the central nervous system. Now, I should say as well, if we consider the neuromuscular system as the, the force potential of the body, uh, this is what the Soviets called motor potential. In a nutshell, it is how much force is your neuromuscular system capable of producing. The CNS is what the Soviets called technical mastery. How well is the brain able to tap into the force potential that you have and apply it in the most efficient manner possible? And obviously, the metabolic system is responsible for providing the fuel and allowing the transfer of energy to carry out the work uh, that the neuromuscular system is capable of producing. So getting straight into the central nervous system, we're going to be doing three primary things uh, in training the CNS. One is to increase um, movement literacy or adding tools to the movement toolbox. The second is to increase the efficiency with which these patterns are carried out in the field of play. And the third is to assist in problem solving and how these are applied. When we speak about movement literacy, this is an idea stolen from a guy named Kelvin Giles, who's an English strength and conditioning coach who's since uh, built a life for himself in Australia. And the idea behind movement literacy is that in, 
in an unpredictable environment like rugby or any other team sport, our athletes are faced with a constantly changing environment in which they have to um, respond to the stimuli around them. And in order to do that, they need a large number of motor patterns at their disposal. If we don't develop those motor patterns, um, when athletes are faced with certain situations, they may not be able to select the most appropriate motor response, and that will reduce chances of success or put them in risky positions in terms of injury risk. So what we're looking to do with movement literacy is develop uh, the fundamental movement patterns that Kelvin re refers to, which for him are squatting, lunging, pushing, pulling, bending, bracing, and twisting. And we've added to uh, that list for our guys to try and reflect the, the broader demands of rugby. And we've included accelerating, top-end sprinting, cutting, shuffling, getting up, um, getting down, jumping, and landing. And we feel that if we can develop these movement patterns in our guys, we're going to give them the greatest possible chance of success on the field of play. Now, once we've developed that movement literacy, what we're then going to do is try and maximize the efficiency of that movement and get rid of all energy leaks where possible. This is going to do three things. One, it's going to allow us to uh, apply force in a more efficient manner, um, which will increase speed of movement. The second is that it's going to reduce the energy cost of activity, which makes sporting skill more sustainable, uh, a given power output. And the third is going to allow us to uh, put the joints in safer positions with regard to non-contact injury risk. And what we need to do to, to get rid of these energy leaks is basically uh, ensure that the athlete masters these movement patterns in a, a, a real simple environment where skills are isolated, slow, simple and closed in that there's no decision making. And then what we need to do is ensure mastery and progress the athlete to environments which are progressively more integrated, faster, more complex and involve decision making. Uh, this is because these conditions more accurately reflect the demands that our athletes are faced with on the field of play. Uh, until we can see uh, athletes master them under these conditions, we know that we're not going to see a, a, a true improvement in performance on the field of play and obviously uh, a reduction in injury risk that comes with that. Once we've achieved that mastery, what we're then going to do is try and provide our athletes with a guided discovery learning environment uh, whereby they learn how to apply these movement patterns in the most efficient manner possible. And all we are simply trying to do here is provide our athletes with a learning environment whereby they are forced to use the movement patterns that we have taught them in previous phases of training, but discover for themselves what is the most effective way of performing these skills on the field of play if they want to be successful within the context of their position, of the sport and of the, the manner in which our team tries to play the game. And this is an important piece of the program, and I think for many programs it's actually a missing piece because you'll be able to relate to this if you're a coach. You'll be familiar with many athletes can refine a motor pattern and have it look uh, extremely efficient in a closed practice, but once you put them in a real-world situation where their, their attention is not focused on the skill but on opposition players, on competition, on, on various other factors, technique will often go out the window. And it can be argued uh, that until we see an improvement in the efficiency of the movement pattern, um, under these conditions that the strength and conditioning program has not fully done its job. Um, so this is an important piece for us and it's where our, our section on training the central nervous system will end for today. In part two we're going to be talking about how we develop the neuromuscular system uh, to increase the horsepower of the engine, uh, the force potential of the body and I will speak to you then. Hey everyone, this is Alan Cosgrove from Results Fitness University and this is the Strength Coach Podcast Business of Fitness segment where we offer you another tip to help grow your fitness business. The tip for this episode is evolve. The fitness business changes a lot and business itself changes a lot and I think a lot of the times we're hesitant to really embrace that. We're hesitant to to you know, change like you'll get clients if you change the color of a wall in your facility, or you add a new exercise. You don't like change. People generally are afraid of it. But in order to get to the next level of your business, we really have to focus on evolution and evolving. Now, the best example of this is that in 2000, uh, the Netflix founder flew out to meet with the Blockbuster guys and offered to partner where Netflix would do mail order, the mail order side of the business where people would get DVDs in the mail and Blockbuster would still be in the stores, but the stores would promote Netflix. And Blockbuster basically laughed them out of the building. Well, 2010, Blockbuster went bankrupt and Netflix are currently worth 
33 billion dollars, which by the way is more than CBS, right? CBS, I think that CSI has uh, football, college football. So Netflix is now worth more than CBS and it's evolved itself from being at the time DVDs in the mail to really an online uh, streaming system. So that's what was called um, a disruptive innovation where they came in and they just changed the game, right? Like you, you wouldn't think it would work when you look back. You wouldn't think that not stopping off and getting a movie uh, is going to be dead. You're just going to order it and it's going to send to you. But part of the disruption was that a lot of people don't know this. Blockbuster made a lot of their income from late fees, right? Close to $200 million a year in late fees. Netflix's original positioning statement was no more late fees. Right? It wasn't about streaming. They've evolved again in this online service with this monthly membership. Right? And it's, this sort of ties in. With, and that's how Blockbuster's response was. Once Netflix was accelerating, they eliminated the late fees, which cut them $200 million in profit. And they started an online service or a delivery service, which cost about another $200 million. And basically, that was the death of them. They, they were unable to evolve fast enough at that point. So other examples of this are, um, you know, Kodak went out of business because of uh, the digital camera. Kodak were never in the camera business, they were in the film business, right? They, you know, digital cameras came along, disrupted, disrupted innovation and changed the game there. Hey, other people have done it are, you know, iTunes obviously changed the game and it led to the death of the CD, uh, pretty, pretty much the death of the CD and everything else other than that, everything's downloadable. So, what we did at Results Fitness is we've obviously evolved over time from one-on-one. -on -one. We did one-on-one -on -one training where people bought sessions, 50 bucks a set or $500 for 10 sessions or 60 bucks per session, largely one-on-one. -on -one. And we evolved to, to semi-private. Uh, for, for new listeners, semi-private training is group training where people are on an individualized program. Right, So it's not a genetic program. And we stopped billing on uh, per session, per workout, and we started billing monthly. Once we did that, <clears throat> we didn't, I'm not sure if we disrupted the, innovated the industry, but we definitely disrupted and innovated our time. No trainer could then be charging per workout when we were charging monthly. And our next evolution was, we went to semi-private 2.0, which is a slightly larger group, but we have two trainers working with them. So there's two coaches with a slightly larger group, and our members get unlimited coaching. So we went from charging one on one per session to now it's a small group of individualized program with two coaches that we build monthly. So the lesson today is really to think about how you can change your industry, how you can change your environment, and look for ways to change. Look for things no one's ever asked about. The perfect example of this is the iPad. The iPad is really the spot between a smartphone and a laptop. It's not as good as a laptop for a lot of things, and it can't make a phone call like your smartphone. So it existed in this area that no one thought we needed something, apart from Apple. And Apple created it, and it's a massive success. So your homework assignment for this week is to evolve. Think of ways where you can change your business that no one's thought of yet. Don't stick to the old per session the same workouts, the same delivery systems. Start thinking of ways you can change. That's it for this week. That is, my name is Alan Cosgrove. That is the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment here on the Strength Coach Podcast. Hello, this is Frank Dolan for the Functional Movement Systems segment. I'll be continuing our series on the FMS Basics, a review of the Functional Movement Screen Fundamentals. For this segment, I'll be discussing the inline lunge. Uh, today we're going to cover for the inline lunge some of the verbal instructions that it's really important to stay on, uh, some tips for testing, the scoring criteria for the test, and then some of the nuances that are often missed, common questions, and common mistakes. All right, to start out, we're going to look at just some of the things that you're going to want to make sure that you're saying as far as the verbal instructions go to the client. Uh, we want to follow this script especially when you first learn the screen, to make sure that we're uh, keeping the consistency and the reliability of the test. You're going to instruct the client to let you know if, you, if they have any pain while performing the following movement. You'll have them step onto the 2x6 with a flat 
right foot. This is if we're scoring the uh, left side and your toe on the zero mark. So on the board, they're going to put their right foot flat on the kit with their toe on the zero. The left heel should be placed according to the tibial measurement marker. So you would get the tibial tuberosity measurement height in the hurdle step test. You're going to use that same number here to indicate where you have them put their left heel in this case. Both toes must be pointed forward with flat feet on the board to start. They'll place the dowel along the spine so it touches the back of their head, their upper back, and the middle of their buttocks. While grasping the dowel, their right hand should be against the back of the neck. So the top arm, that hand will be behind the neck, and the left hand should be against their lower back or at the small of their back. Maintaining an upright posture so the dowel stays in contact with their head, upper back, and top of their butt, they descend into a lunge position so the right knee touches the two by six behind the left heel. They will return to the starting position from there. You'll ask them if they understand the instructions and proceed with the test. The equipment here you'll need is the dowel and of course the two by six board. Some of the tips for testing is that we wanna make sure that we're scoring the front leg. So in the case that we talked about in the verbal instructions, that's gonna be the left side. We wanna make sure the dowel remains vertical and in contact with their head, thoracic spine, and sacrum throughout the movement. The front heel must remain in contact with the board and the back heel must touch the board when returning to the start position. We're watching for loss of balance and any movement in those feet. We want to remain close to the client to prevent the complete loss of balance for safety. We repeat the test on both sides, scoring if the right leg is forward, that's a right side score. And the client can perform the movement up to three times on each side if necessary to make sure that we're scoring the best out of those three. The criteria that we're looking for to get a 3, 2, 1, or 0, of course, if it, there is pain at present at, with any of the movement, it's a 0. To get a 3, the dowel must maintain contact with the head, the back, and the butt. They have to keep the dowel vertical. No torso movement must be noted, and the dowel and feet must remain in the sagittal plane. The knee should touch behind the board of the heel of the front foot or on the board behind the heel of the front foot. To get a two, the dowel may come off the head, the back, or the butt <clears throat> if the dowel does not remain vertical, so typically a forward movement. If movement is noted in the torso, any type of rotation. If the dowel and the feet do not remain in the sagittal plane. If the knee does not touch behind the heel of the front foot, we cannot give them a three. To get a score of one, we would see loss of balance and we would see an inability to complete the movement pattern as a whole. Some of the common nuances that are often missed in questions and mistakes is that we see a foot position that's not straight ahead, especially with the back foot. If someone cannot get in the position, that would count as a one. We're not seeing them have the ability to get on the board and get in position to have the test done. So we have to score that a one. The knee must touch behind the front foot. As mentioned in the criteria, that's just something that we commonly see is that the knee falls outside of that line. You do not want to tell them their mistakes throughout the test. This is commonly seen as well. We can only repeat instructions. If you see that the foot's not straight or you see that the stick's coming off their back, you can't tell them what they're doing wrong. Just repeat the instructions that you gave them from the beginning. Return the back heel back to the board is another one. If they're just going ahead into the lunge, they come back up and the heel back heel remains off the board. We want to see that that heel comes back to this original start position. So again, we would just repeat instructions and have them go back to the original start position. The top elbow can come forward. So as long as the hand is behind the, the top hand is behind the neck, it's okay where that elbow position is. As long as they're in that same position with the stick touching their head, their back and their butt. The hand position is important. We want to make sure that they uh, do have the hand behind the neck and the bottom hand behind the small of the back. It can't be outside of those two points. And I think one of the things that we see a lot of is that people are looking at one specific area. So they're either looking at the feet or they're looking at the stick. We want to make sure we're looking at both positions. So look at the entire picture, not just one point of focus. That has been our assessment of the inline lunge. 
some of the verbal instructions, the tips for testing, the scoring criteria, and some of those nuances that are commonly missed. Next time, we'll have shoulder mobility. For more information, check out functionalmovement.com. All right, now it's time for the Hit the Gym with the Strength Coach. And today I have an old friend on, Anna Hartman. Anna, we first met about mm, 10 years ago. She was uh, kind of interning still at uh, at Athletes Performance, now Exos. And she was um, working with Sue Falsone at the time, Falsoni. Um, and, you know, she had some strength and conditioning um, uh, intern under two legends, Luke Richardson and Daryl Eto. Um, so she's kind of been all over she's an athletic trainer now she has her own company um where you can see her stuff at movement rev or movement rev.com Anna, thanks for coming on today thanks for having me all right very cool there's um a lot of talk right now about um your lecture actually i didn't even plan on having you on and then mike <laughs> last time was talking about your stuff and then i i didn't get a chance to see it because it was on body by bull online and i so i finally got on and then i was like oh wow this this is some pretty cool stuff and i i like to you know see what mike is always like to check out what mike really thinks is important so um <laughs> i uh uh, you know, when we were talking on the podcast yesterday, I recorded my segment with him yesterday and he, you know, we, we pretty much had about, I don't know, maybe 12 or 15 minutes. We didn't have that much time, but we, we, it's on this episode. We talked all about your, your lecture and some things that he got out of it. So I said, like, you know, I, I really need to get Anna on because we have the article that we posted on strengthcoach.com, which is kind of um, glosses over for the most, not just glosses over, but glosses over about being in tune. It's called How in Tune is Your Body? But you put the 12 resting postures, and we're going to talk more about that in a few minutes, um, on there. And um, so I wanted to get you on to talk a little bit about, you know, just what all this stuff is. I mean, I know you said in your lecture that, you know, you're trying to get people to be more aware to sense better and, you know, stimulating yeah. almost all of their sensory organs. And this is very uh, heavily influenced from Philip Beach. Um, so talk to us a, a little bit about uh, uh, getting in tune with our body. Yeah, um, it's sort of, uh, I love that when I went to uh, uh, Mike's place when I was in Boston, that he was as moved by the information as I was, because when I learned it from Philip back in April, it was like, oh my gosh, this is a game changer. This has been like the missing piece for me and my work. And so um, I've been playing around with it since April and I just, um, I, I, I still think it's really amazing and I, I, I'm still sort of playing with it and learning it too. So um, I'm happy to be able to share it, but his whole um, premise, he has a model of movement based on um, embryology, uh, evolutionary vertebrate biology in the Chinese meridians where he describes um, a way to sort of map the body and explain whole body movement and whole organism movement. So, um, you know, so for so long, our field, any field of medicine or sports medicine, exercise science is um, reducing everything to its parts, which was great. Um, and it helps us to understand things, but at the same time, it's sort of gotten a, us away from um, the human as an organism and an animal and, um, and it's sort of a return to that and a return to um, looking at uh, not only how we move well, but then how we rest too. So that really resonated with me as well because um, one of my favorite quotes from Mark Versagan over the years was work plus rest equals success. And um, we found that the athletes, of course, they work really hard, but they didn't know how to rest. And so if we could just um, help them with that component of resting in terms of recovery um, and things they could do from an active recovery standpoint to restore the balance of their muscles and joints and nutrition, sleep, all of that stuff that goes into it, they perform so much better. So this just took the whole rest or recovery category to a, a different level for me in terms of how does the organism through history rest? And humans have always rested on the ground, um, especially in, you know, uh, the majority of the time people were humans and we didn't have furniture and, um, you know, concrete and that kind of thing. Um, we were resting on the ground outside. And so that Philip Beach proposed that we're such a highly evolved organism 
when things are highly evolved like that, they have their own self-tuning mechanism to keep them healthy and to keep them alive. And he argued that these rest postures, these 12 postures, um, are how our body does that, is they recognize when we're in them and sort of turns the body, flips the, flips the switch to that rest and digest um, nervous system response, which is really when the body can start to heal itself. It, it, um, God. Yeah. It, so it, you can go ahead. Yeah, it's very interesting in terms of, I mean, I think we're – like you talked about Mark and Mark up, uh, you know, uh, work plus rest equals success. And we, we, we hear a lot about recovery, uh, right now. Everybody, a lot of people are talking about, especially since there's been more data and more monitoring to figure right. out, you know, are people sleeping right? Are they, are they getting enough sleep? Are they eating the right nutrition? Are they, you know, then we have all these artificial recovery things, right? Where, uh, and I, I don't want to say artificial, but like, you know, the different pools, the hot and cold pools. And yeah, the, the modalities. Cold, yeah, the different cold chambers. And, and everything, and and here we are with, and it just seems like everything in fitness goes back to, you know, we always seem to go back to the basics, or uh, mm-hmm. you know, oh, you don't need all that other stuff. But it's interesting right. to me. I mean, okay, so we were on the ground, but if I have a good firm mattress, isn't? I mean, how? I mean, because you you allow people to use different props in the rest postures, and we're going to go over those sure. rest postures. But so if I have a good firm mattress, aren't I really? And I'm on my back or my stomach with the, a couple of the positions that you are, because I sleep like that sometimes. So um, yeah. or on my side, um, aren't I really doing the same thing in my bed? Um, yeah, and that is a. Re- I mean, you are in a rest posture when you're in your bed, and if it's firm, then you're closer to a traditional rest posture. But it's the ability to access all of them that is important and, and access them throughout the day. Because we spend all day in such a stressed out environment and we're constantly in this, you know, stress response, especially if we're training, we're adding an additional stress response, right? It's important for us to get little parts of the day implement rest in there too. So you can switch the, you know, switch between the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, you know, if you're only getting it while you're, you know, while you're sleeping, it's just, you know, you're missing out on other opportunities throughout the day. Um, and then too, you think about how many people in their bed are really actually in a firm, really firm mattress and not using a pillow. And, you know, and, and that's not going to be very many people. Most people like lots of pillows and for it to feel comfortable. <clears throat> and um, the difference between using the, using the props are really important when you're working on improving the rest posture. But when you're actually resting, um, you know, in a perfect world, in a, in a body that's perfectly in tune, you wouldn't need any props. You wouldn't need the pillows. You wouldn't need stuff under your knees or under your neck or um, whatever, your body would just be able to be in those positions comfortably. And so the pillows are, a, a, um, and the towel rolls are a way to get us back to being in tune. Um, and just like any other format of evaluation and treatment, like the, the test that we fail end up, ends up being the exercise, right? The same thing with the rest postures, the rest posture that we can't do ends up oftentimes being the one we're trying to use as an exercise to be able to access it. And so there's a difference between the work we do to be able to get into the rest postures and then actually using the rest postures as rest. Interesting. Um, Wait, so let's go back to the sleep. So ideally, we really shouldn't be using a pillow? Ideally, uh, Philip would argue not. (laughs) Yeah, his work would argue that, yeah, if our body is in tune, then we shouldn't need a pillow because... Are you know, and you see that. So, it, what I really liked about that idea of sleeping without a pillow is when I'm working with one of my athletes. Uh, um, one of the things that I use a, as a um, evaluation, basically, is I lie them on their back. Um, sometimes with like straight, sometimes with like bent, but I look at what their head position looks like when they're resting on the floor. Are they the person whose chin just out <clears throat> and they're resting on more of the um, you know, more of the top of the cranium than at the occiput, or is somebody, or, or are they resting on the occiput and their head is um, relatively in line with their um, thorax, 
And so um, usually with people with stiff thoracic spines, they're the people whose chin jets out and they're resting more towards the crown of their head. Those are some, that's somebody who needs the pillow. Oftentimes if a person places the pillow underneath the neck and just supports that already bad position instead of putting it under the occiput and bringing the head up to the level of the rib cage. So that you're, re- you know, you're bringing the floor to the head. If you went an orthotic, right? Bringing, you know, you're just sort of changing the surface to let the body come to it um, in, in that sense. So um, it's not that everyone should, it's not like everybody should go home tonight and sleep on the floor and not use pillows, right? People, a lot of people would be in pain because a lot of people are out of tune. But the goal should be to eventually be able to get to that. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And that was my, yeah. I mean, I think for, I've been struggling lately with that. And then I just, I took a nap on one of my mats earlier um, in my facility um, because yeah. I'm just trying to test it out. And, you know, I didn't have a mm-hmm. pillow and I, I, I was on the, um, uh, one of the poses, one of the rest postures that you have is this, or Philip, is the sideline rest posture. And I basically slept mm-hmm. in that sideline rest posture because I think if I was in a supine position, I probably might, that might bother my neck a little bit because I obviously, I definitely have some issues with that and like tight right. thoracic spine, maybe a little forward head mm-hmm. posture. Um, but, you know, in general, I think the supine rest posture, the prone rest posture, prone rest posture can be, um, um, probably tough for some people, including me. Like I've been having yeah. some issues with like neck rotation, but I think it would mm-hmm. be important, especially for somebody like me who works with golfers, because that neck rotation is really important to be able to yeah. access. Um, mm-hmm. And we've been doing some, you know, crocodile breathing on that, but I haven't really, I probably would want to throw some of that prone rest posture in there. But those are three easy ones. Yeah. The Japanese sit yeah. posture, um, I've been doing for a while anyway. And the toe rest posture, I did, used to do kind of as a little bit of a uh, of a warm up because my, like my feet and my uh, Achilles would always feel a little tight. Now I've been trying right. a little bit longer and it's really helped me. But man, that, that toe sit is brutal yes it is it is the most brutal for me as well and so far for the majority of the people I've looked at it um with it's like the toast that is toast it and then the drinking posture since it comes out of that those are the two that like most not you know most everybody has or is challenged with as well as the full squat as you know everybody knows like that, that's like the holy grail right in the yeah. drinking conditioning world is trying to get people to do a full deep squat and and so it's no surprise that those are the ones that across the board seems um, most difficult for people to access. Um, and and it's, a fun, it's funny to me, though, because especially for the athletes, I think the um, toe is the one that is like you could argue is most applicable to sport, yeah. like, you know, like um, great toe extension and dorsiflexion is so important, you know, for any sort of running mechanic um, or rotational comp- component in the body. That it, so it's, it's ironic to me that the people who need it the most seem to be the ones who can't get it at all. Yeah. And, you know, I, I tried the drinking posture and um, yeah. my stomach muscle, my abs, mm-hmm. I had a, I cramped up. I couldn't believe it. Like at one point, like I got really low and then, you know, my balance uh-huh. came off, but my, my abs cramped up and I was like dying. So and I was showing somebody, one of my clients that, you know, kind of going over, <laughs> going over the, right. the position and, oh man, it was pretty embarrassing. But, um, yeah. but like something like the long sit, the Neanderthal rest posture, where basically if mm-hmm. anybody, for everybody who's listening, it's like, you have the cross-legged posture, uh, the Neanderthal, and the long sit. You're just sitting on your butt. The long sit is just your legs are basically straight out. Neanderthal right. is where you almost have like a diamond where your the bottoms of your feet are touching. And then the cross-legged is, you know, a typical old-school cross-legged posture, which I haven't gotten into or well, except last night I, I watched TV for a little while in the different positions. Um, mm-hmm. No way I'm getting in half half lotus that's just not happening right. for, for a while <laughs> um and the side sit i was doing okay in full full squat i have to elevate my heels and then i could right. sit in it for a while and again so it's okay to use some of these props right 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's the only way that you're going to bring your body back in tune is um, practicing the postures, and but practicing them in a pain-free way and in an achievable way. Like, you want to be able to do it, right? Nobody likes to, um, to be given a task that they can't do. So it's like um, the more you can make it achievable for, the, um, for your client and pain-free, the, you know, the more likely they are to practice it. And then the more likely they are to then eventually be able to access it as a actual posture of rest. And then the more in tune their body is. And Um, and just like everything else, you know, then the better performance they have and then less likely they are to get hurt. Yeah. And I was saying to uh, my clients that about one of the things that I really like about this is I really do feel like this is easy homework. You know, oh, yeah. um, you know, worst case scenario, uh, you know, you get some supine rest posture, some some of the prone rest posture, uh, side lying rest posture on both sides. Um, and then you play around a little bit with the Japanese sit and the toe sit, um, right. you know, it long sit and Neanderthal and cross legged relatively easy. It's not that hard to do some of these. And I think I like the way you would say, yeah, just do 30 seconds each. Uh, during the yeah. day and, and, you know, do what you can try to get some of these things done. And, and I think, um, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll definitely feel a little better. I, I can already feel some of the mobility in the lower yeah. body that, that is, um, I'm feeling yeah. much better. It was interesting when I first learned it, Philip kept on saying, he was like, you'll be surprised how quick your body will change. And I'm like, oh, yeah, right, because I've tried a million things yeah. to improve my ankle mobility and make things feel better in my own body, and it hasn't been a quick fix. But it really it, it truly was noticeable changes when I, I, I did these specific things, um, which I thought was, what was, like you said, what was so powerful about it, because it's really easy. It's an easy homework to give people. And, and, you know, most motivated clients, if you have motivated clients, they want they want something to do on their, you know, when they're not with you. And so sometimes I am always like, it's a challenge to give them something that I know that they're not going to totally mess up or make themselves worse at home. And so it's like such a great tool to be able to give them this because it's like, it's pretty easy to teach them at least one modification for themselves to go home and practice. Now, as long as they're true to the, it can't be painful. Okay, that was that. Yeah, that's my next question because, <clears throat> or after this one. But now, when we were in some of these positions, like for me, I, you know, as strength and conditioning fitness professionals, we're, we all were always like, well, the back's not flat, and this is that, and that, you know, we're very critical of the right. certain positions. And so last night, before I really got to see the whole um, lecture, I'm worried that, you know, in my, because I know Johnny Neanderthal was not sitting around with a, with a straight back. I mean, he had his hunch back over, you know, he was, he had some, some roundness in his back. That's okay too, <laughs> right? To have a little bit of that and not freak out over specifically. Yeah. I mean, this. yeah. So you're, I mean, your spine's supposed to, supposed to move all over the place, you know, at any time you want it to. Um, the key is, that it can move in other directions too. So you're not just stuck in one way. Um, so, you know, yeah, is it okay to be in the posture with a little bit of, you know, like a slouch spine? Sure. But are you going to rest like that? If you're going to rest like that, I would argue that you probably can't do that for 20 minutes without it, something not feeling right. So does that make sense? Like most yeah. of the time that's where the delineation is, is it's like, if you're truly not, a hundred percent able to access it then because if you were to spend 20 minutes in it or longer, you would, something would hurt in your neck or your low back. Right. So trying to achieve a more upright spine, um, it would be the goal. Um, so, uh, it's like, yeah, you don't have to hold it. So I don't, I don't want people thinking that, when you're sitting in one of those postures watching TV that you have to be like militant in holding your posture and that in a good position, because that, that, you know, of course that's not going to feel very good, but be aware of it. And, you know, it, the, the whole thing Philip says is like, if you're leaning against the wall while you're sitting on the floor in these rest postures, or you're leaning on your arm, um, you're no, you know, you're no better than a baby because the baby can sit in an upright posture on the floor. Like, for a long mm-hmm. time, no problem. Like low energy costs, not that big of a deal. 
So the fact that we can't do it without slouching or leaning on something for support means that, you know, we're more out of tune than the young child is. Yep. So, um, but yeah, it's not like you cannot sit in this po- in this posture unless it's perfect. So, yeah. And that was, that's, um, you know, I've got, I've done the same thing. Like I've gone through the spectrum of, over my career of not really understanding movement, understanding it, and then being really picky that it has to be perfect. Yeah. And then, and now I'm coming back around of being like, eh, it doesn't have to be perfect and let the person figure it out. And there's value in letting people make mistakes. Um, as long as you're always, it's okay to make a mistake if the mistake also has awareness with it. If somebody is not aware and they're making a mistake, then the mistake has no value to it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yep. And so, I, yeah. I think what's interesting as well is, you know, I'll remind everybody, there's 12 postures. And actually, you know, you guys use this as an assessment where you're scoring on a 0 to 12. Right. So how many postures are accessible without pain or discomfort for 20 minutes? Now, you'd be surprised. I mean, I think everybody would be out there and think, oh, yeah, I could probably do 8 or 9. No, you're probably going to get a 4. Yeah, there's, it's there's not some, very much. Yeah. Now, the pain thing is interesting because um, – you know, part of me, for example, in the toe sit was, all right, just go a little longer. Or the Japanese sit, go a little longer, go a little <laughs> right. longer. But, you know, you know, work it out a little bit, you know, because we're used to that. You know, as athletes, we're used to kind of pushing through it. But, right. but we're really kind of doing ourselves a disservice, aren't we? Because we're not truly resting yeah. then. Yes, that's exactly right. Okay. So we got to make say, sure. Yeah, I mean, that's the hardest thing, I think, for everybody that I've come across is, showing them this, whether it's an athlete or um, a regular client or a, a coach or, you know, like I'm just sharing the education is people want to push through it. And it's like when I'm like, no, like put as many, like don't be embarrassed how many towel rolls or pillows or whatever you have, like try it. Like, just try it for a couple of weeks, like truly sticking to like it's comfortable the whole time and, and see what happens. And then if you think, you know, and then try it, try it your way for two weeks of pushing through it a little bit more and and see what has better outcome. And in my experience, when you push through it, like things hurt. (laughs) And then when things hurt, other things shut down and, and it's not, it's not, you know, it's just not as beneficial. And I think that, you know, going back to what you said, like you're truly not resting. Mm -hmm. I really am feeling like there's some sort of value in, um, like what Philip was saying, that our organism will self-tune itself when it knows we are resting. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so if you never knows we're resting, then you never give the intelligence of our body a chance to adapt and fix itself. Yep. It's and so, um, and, and that's the thing too, is like, so the, the, the postures that you can't access, you know, that are challenges for you and you're working on to improve, that's your exercise program, right? That those are your corrective, mm-hmm. if you want to call it that. The postures that you can access for rest comfortably, those are the postures that you want to go home. And if you like watching TV at the end of the night, that's when you want to spend time on the floor in those postures that you can access. And just, and then to me, it was noticing the difference in my life when I was spending more time on the floor and postures I could access that were my rest postures. I noticed that I had more energy that sitting and watching TV at night didn't totally drain me. Right. Mm-hmm. Like I used to refer to the TV as like, you know, like my grandma always called it the boob tube, right. Cause mm-hmm. you sit in front of it and you turn into a zombie. Well, if I sit in front of it, watch the same exact shows, and sit on the floor, I feel one way at the end of the night versus if I sit on the couch, slouched and comfortable with all my pillows and finish watching the TV, I feel like a zombie. When I sit on the floor and watch it, it just feels like I spent two hours, you know, you know, being entertained. It, It didn't turn me into a total zombie and feel like I'm exhausted and have to immediately go to bed. Like I actually get done watching TV and feel like, okay, should I work on the computer on something or should I take the dog outside to go to the bathroom or should I go to bed? So it's, that to me, noticing that difference started to point out the power of actual letting our body 
be in a rest posture that it recognizes as rest. Yeah, good stuff. I mean, Coach Boyle was talking about right now, I think he's putting it in his warm-up, but only for an educational piece. Uh, to right. kind of make sure that, you know, they understand the movements. And I think he's really going towards this as uh, a cool down. Um, mm-hmm. And that, that was my question for you. Where do you feel? I know, you know, you want us to give it to our clients for homework. Um, but from right. from our strength conditioning perspective, and, you know, you were saying in the lecture that, you know, especially in Arizona, you felt like the warm up might not be as important as we think. Whereas, you know, the cool down, if we use some of these postures as cool downs, we'd be getting a lot more, uh, a lot more out of it. Where in the program are we looking at this? Um, well, there's a couple of things with that question is, um, first in general. So the, the whole cool down thing came up because, um, from, um, learning from Philip Beach, he was saying that it was the most bang for your buck is to work on these, um, rest postures and, and improving these rest postures. Um, after you work out, so a cool down, because he was saying after your workout, you know, your body is really warm and all your muscles are really moldable. And so you have an opportunity for a lot of change um, when you then tell the body you're resting. So it can adapt, you know, if your quads are really tight or your adductors are really tight and limiting you from a cross-legged position, then after your workout, if you spend time working on getting into that cross-legged position, you're more likely to then keep those changes. Um, as opposed to if you go sit in a car or sit in a chair and the body, even though it's um, an unweighted squat to the body, it's not resting to the body. That's a squat. That's holding a squat. So imagine how comfortable it is to your body to hold a squat for an extended period of time. That's the same thing as sitting in a chair. When you're talking about the intelligence of ourselves, recognizing a position as is, are we doing something or are we resting? And so in that standpoint, if you go and sit in a chair, your quad's going to kind of mold to the length of sitting in the chair. But if you go and sit on the floor where your body knows it's resting and it's at a really full length of your whole uh, muscle system of the quads and the um, erector spinae, then everything's lengthened. So you're maximizing the length and then adding in that body, the, the body recognizing it as a rest posture. So that's sort of his argument for why putting it after workouts and um, why there's, it's just so powerful after workouts is because you can get a lot out of it. Um, you know, and my point with the warm up versus the cool down was like I said, yeah, like you said, I said in Arizona, I sometimes question the need for a really long session of movement prep to warm somebody up. If your, if your goal is to truly warm them up, So it goes back to whenever you're choosing anything, any exercise, any part of your workout, why you're choosing it. So if I'm choosing to do a certain length of time movement prep because part of the reason is to actually warm their body up, then I don't need, like, why do I need to do that for 15 minutes in Arizona when it's 110 outside, right? So um, that doesn't make sense. So you can make your warm up in the summertime a little bit shorter. Um, however, if my movement prep session, warm up session was 15 minutes because, you know, I wanted to really make sure in that 15 minutes I um, did some, you know, um, stretches to teach some hip or stretching or exercises to teach hip hinging because hip hinging was an important component of my lift that day, or I wanted to teach, um, you know, or go through, um, you know, toe extension and dorsiflexion because we're doing acceleration drills today. So that toe sit posture would be really valuable to start with because it mimics that position. You know, those are reasons to put it in the warm up, right? Because it makes sense to what you're trying to build upon. Yeah. And then it's like, well, then why are we even calling it a warm up? You could call it whatever you wanted because, um, you know, it's, it's preparing the body for whatever you're doing in the session. I still think that is hundred percent important and you need to do it. And maybe you'll find some of these rest postures are positions that are great to prepare somebody for a certain movement. However, but when we're talking about bringing the body back into tune and, uh, and bringing the body to be able to access these rest postures, 
at the end of the program, at the end of the workout as a cool down is ideal. Does that okay. sort of make sense? Yeah, absolutely. It, what I'm seeing too with this is – you know, a lot of crossover. I mean, the breathing portion, we, you know, we want to be able to breathe in all of these different yeah. positions. I'm looking, you mm-hmm. know, Sherry Walter from X, XO, Sherry Walters did a, a lecture at Perform Better about pelvic floor health, was talking about staying in the deep mm-hmm. squat po- posture for extended yeah. periods of time and how that helps your pelvic floor. Um, we mm-hmm. have like things like animal flow or move net. There's a lot of move net stuff that, um, that I was seeing when, because, you know, we're going to talk next about getting up off the ground and that's because yeah. that's the next important mm-hmm. part and MoveNet had a lot of these same ideas where you know kind of going to that half kneeling position and moving on up from there and I actually taught somebody one of my I have an 81 year old client and she fell down in her bedroom and she told me she was having a hard time getting up this is like last year and, and so I couldn't teach her the, the Turkish get up but I basically taught her literally the the way you got up in my at Mike's lecture where you were oh, in right. almost the uh, the the side this uh, the uh, Z sit oh, yeah. and then yeah. you lean over your um, over your knee and you put both hands mm-hmm. on the ground and then you go to quadruped and then you end up doing almost like a um like a hand push back up like a hamstring stretch yeah. type thing where exactly. so it was pretty amazing you know that when i saw yeah. you do it it was just very natural so talk to us about all right we're on the ground we got the resting postures down now and everybody can see those on your uh youtube page as well if you're not shrankcoach.com members right are those all on your youtube page um they are except that they're not public links right now oh, okay. but i'll okay. make i'll switch it so it's public okay. um it's fine and then, or just join strengthcoach.com for a dollar for yeah, three days. Um, exactly. Um, but uh, talk to us about getting up now. Yeah, so um, that's like, so when I said that, when I learned this, it was like a missing piece for me. So um, that was part of like the, the, the puzzle piece was everybody is talking about and has been talking about for a while the importance of standing up from the ground. And um, whether it is, like you said, from the deep squat for the pelvic floor health or, or um, Turkish get-ups or um, crawling patterns or rolling patterns, whatever it is, people have been talking about the importance of it for a while now. And so what the rest postures do is not only is it starts to um, address the balance between movement and rest, but it also makes us have to get up from the floor. So now getting up from the floor is not just part of your workout. It's part of every day, a lot of times during the day, as it would be in history, um, which is what helps us keep us in tune as well. So um, keeping us in tune is being able to access the rest postures, but also being able to stand up from the floor. And um, so that's the benefit is the more time you spend on the floor, the more time you have to stand up from the floor. And so you can pick any way you want to, sort of like you said, that you created this way to get up for your client um, because it made sense to you in your head of how to transition safely and effectively from the ground. So here's where the creativity comes in and and the fun part and the people who are like more creative than me um, put together wonderful sequences of learning how to get up from the floor. So um yeah, that, that's a huge part. Uh, Philip Beach refers to these exercises as erector sizes. Um, so erecting from the floor, basically. He was just trying to pick a fun word to describe them besides saying standing from the floor or sit to stand transitions. Um, so he calls them erector sizes. So um, when he teaches a workshop, um, a, a, a movement workshop, he spends um, the day, you know, a couple days teaching us all the rest postures as well as teaching us how to get up from the floor um, in a million different ways, like more than you could think of. And I think I put on the article on um, the webpage a link maybe to um, – actually, I didn't. He, uh, This is a different lecture I had. He has a um, class on uh, – like a 35-minute class demonstrating all of this on Pilates anytime, and you can do a free trial there if you just want to check out that um, um, 35-minute movement class. But you can see Philip take people through – um, erecting from the floor, his erector sizes to get some ideas too. But um, cool. that's why I loved it is it was totally the missing piece of the puzzle of, been, you know, the more time you spend on the floor, the more time you have to get up from the floor. And I think the more 
time you spend in some of these positions, the easier it is to get up from the floor because you're now, exactly. you're now you've changed some of the mobility and, you know, in, in like, for, like, for example, for ankle mobility, et cetera, um, mm-hmm. you're able to move a little bit better now because of that. Yes. And, uh, and it makes it easier. So it's a good, <laughs> and it's funny, erector yeah. sizes. I thought that was a typo. Yeah. And Mike did too. Yeah. <laughs> I saw him in the email. I was like, yeah. and then I thought you just didn't, I was like, oh, I got to change that. And then I was like, wait a minute. I think she said that in the last um, yeah, no, erector <laughs> Um All right, cool. So let's talk a little bit about really what you're really feeling is important. Mike thought it was so important. He went out and he made a rock board. Um, yeah. And that is, you know, you're, you're feeling like you guys are talking about stimulating the soles of your feet to provide important sensory input. So we're not getting enough sensory input. And my question is this. We just had Jesse Stenson on a couple episodes yeah. ago, and Jesse's really huge, big on this kind of barefoot training right now, too. Um, we have seen the pendulum go both ways. Uh, we see a lot of minimalist, um, a lot of minimalist uh, shoes. I train barefoot, but... Mm-hmm. But the question is, am I, I'm not doing enough, I guess, because I'm, I'm still on my gym floor and, you know, it's just the rubber mats. So although I don't have, um, uh, I don't have sneakers on, I, I'm still not getting enough sensory, uh, input into my foot. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Even what you're doing barefoot on the, on the mat is pretty darn boring for your foot. Um, it's, it's not as boring as being inside a sock inside of a shoe in a dark space, <laughs> but it is not very exciting. Uh, so, um, so the importance, um, you know, so uh, Philip and, um, I, well, this is again, going back to why I felt his work was the missing piece. So most everybody's talking about the, um, you know, some important things that you need to do with people is they need to move right, to be healthy, um, and they need to be aware or be sensing things, like sensory information is really important. Um, and I sort of put breathing under that column as well. And then also uh, they need to spend time resting or recovering, right? So, like, everybody agrees that all of that is important. And But yet sometimes people just sort of brush over the sensory part of it and so when you really look at the sensory organs, what our sensory organs are, you know, you have your um, eyes and ears and nose and um, taste, um, and then you have your vestibular system, and then you have your um, in touch, right? So touch is part of the um, uh, proprioceptive system, right? So um, you've got those senses, plus, you know, we have the proprioceptive system that's within our bodies too, within the fascia and within the joints. And so what happens is, um, well, two things. So if you look at, uh, I think there's a picture on the um, article I posted uh, of an example of a sensory homunculus and a picture of what it would look like in our body if our our body parts were the size um of importance of the sensory organ. So this, this man looks like he's got really huge feet and hands and really huge mouth and tongue and, um, and then large, uh, sex organs. And then ears are pretty large and the eyes and the nose. So just looking at that starts to show you a representation of what's really important in our sensory cortex, so how we sense through the world. world. And so our hands and feet are the biggest. And so hands and feet are, hand, you know, just through evolution, going from four feet on the ground to two feet on the ground, you've taken out like half of the sensory information, right? And we still get sensory information in our hands by touching things and grabbing things, but it doesn't really orient our body in space as much as the sensory information from our feet. Um, but then with our feet, we stick them in shoes and socks. Um, and, or if they're not in shoes and socks, we put them on flat surfaces, whether the flat surface is a mat or hardwood floors or linoleum or carpet, whatever it is, or if it's concrete outside. Um, and it's still pretty boring, even if we have our shoes and socks off. So what Philip 
recommends is a return to actually being on um, Earth outside because um, Earth is unpredictable, right? And there's many different textures that go along with Earth, which starts to give our foot different information, different things to feel. So he basically says, um, one of his quotes is he says that, you know, what we do our, with our feet would be no different if we took the color out of our vision. You know, how boring would that be for us? Or if we imagine our hearing, if we took certain um, levels of um, sound out of the, what we could hear, right? Like life becomes a little bit less interesting. And so um, he argues that we need to give our feet a life again. And, and one of the primary reasons is not just because the, um, it's our, you know, according to the sensory cortex, one of our most important senses is the touch, but because specifically the soles of our feet are innervated by the same nerves that innervate the um, small muscles of our pelvic floor and our low back. And so our pelvic floor and our low back are constantly getting information of touch and environment based on um, information from our feet. So if we're taking that information out, then there's less opportunity for the little spinal muscles to adjust um, our spine in space, right, and to adjust um, you know, whatever they need to adjust within the joints to keep the joint ha- healthy and happy. And so he, you know, suggested that, you know, that there's been a, a trend of back pain um, in the society increasing, right? Back pain continues to increase no matter how much we've learned about it. We, we've figured out, you know, everything that you can think of about the disc, why somebody would have pain, you know, people are still trying to kind of figure out where the fascia lies with the back pain. But for the most part, we've really expanded our knowledge on the mechanics of the anatomy and physiology of the back and the nerve. But yet this hasn't changed the incidence of people having back pain. And so he was saying that um, just like many people like Jesse Stensley would say, like if you look at track, um, you know, footwear use, footwear use increases, back pain increases, right? So he was arguing that perhaps that is why our um, backs have become unhealthy is because we're taking out such an important um, sensory organ out of the mix of telling our spine where we are in space. And so he suggests making rock mats um, to use in your home uh, because it's often easier to bring that inside um, than take your shoes and socks off and actually go outside for a walk for multiple reasons. Here in Arizona, there's cactus needles out there, so it wouldn't be very comfortable for me to go step on a cactus needle. And, you know, obviously in the um, winter in the Northeast, sometimes it's snowy and icy and it wouldn't be very comfortable to be barefoot. So if you can bring um, that interesting earth inside and spend time um, walking on it or standing on it, then, um, you know, you can still make it a little bit interesting for your feet. And so um, the other thing I loved about it is it means no extra time out of your day, which we already are so, you know, maxed out on time during the day. Whenever we can add things in like this that, you know, don't cost anything from a time standpoint, it's huge. So I made, um, I glued the rocks to a bath mat and I put them in my shower. And so every morning I take a 20 minute shower. And so every morning I start my day with 20 minutes of standing or walking on my rock. And 20 so I'm minutes. Stimulating my back. 20 minutes. Yeah, shower. I know, right? Yeah, what's that water bill doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't live in California clearly with the drought, but, um, so, and I also have one in front of my oven and in front of my kitchen sink in the kitchen. So when I'm cooking and when I'm cleaning up from cooking, I'm constantly standing on the rocks. And just like Mike did when I told him about it, when Philip Beach told me about this, I was like, okay, I got to try this out. And I learned from him on a Thursday and a Friday. And on Sunday, I made myself a rock mat. And two weeks, within two weeks, um, my back pain, my like achiness that I'd have in my back every morning, Usually would take me about an hour, hour and a half to feel like my back was feeling good in the morning. Um, that was gone. Like I'd wake up and my back felt great. And then I had knee pain going up and down stairs, which I live on the second floor. So I'd feel that every day. 
two weeks, that was gone. My ankle mobility had increased, and I hadn't started the rest postures yet. I hadn't even started playing around with the toe sitting and stuff like oh, that. Oh, wow. All I did was implement the rock mat, and within two weeks, I had a significant difference, difference wow. change in the quality of my life in terms of back pain, um, you know, and ankle mobility and knee pain. So and um, 20 minutes? It was like, holy cow. 20, he, he suggests 20 to 30 minutes minimum a day standing or walking on rock. Okay. Well, I got a question though. What if I, um, um, I definitely need to have my socks off, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, uh, not, not definitely. Okay. You know, some people's feet are like, some people are really, really attached to having their, you know, socks on their feet. They mm-hmm. have some sort of weird, they're not weird. They just don't love their feet being touched or don't like, you know, they are afraid of the germs or whatever. Yeah. You can have socks on, but, you know, still you would want some sort of rock or uneven surface type thing. Yeah, as long as we're doing the interesting surface, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. And ideally, yeah, socks off is ideal. Is it a deal breaker? Like you don't get any value in doing it with socks on? No, not at all. Of course you get value in it. Uh, And, yeah, and same thing with the spiky balls and all the other different devices that they have to, you know – for sensory information. All of that is great. It's just most of the spiky balls and spiky mats are uniform, right? And so okay. it's not that different and it doesn't change over time. So, and even with the rock mats, if you're going to glue the rocks to the mat, you know, every so often you might want to change the rocks up and get yourself a new mat or change it somehow so the rocks can become sharper or bigger or smaller. So you're constantly giving new information to your feet. Okay. And so just like any other sensory information or any information we get in our body and we adapt to it, you got to keep making it interesting. Yeah. And so I have these kind of like half spiky balls that are for balance. And um, mm-hmm. those seem to be, I've been playing with those last couple of days and those seem to be, uh, at least they'll, it'll change up because you know, they're, they're like inflatable. So it's going to change right. the way my ankle steps on them. And then from Guido, uh, we had Guido on Guido Van Rysen, yeah. um on the podcast talking about just being able to even at least once a week to change the environment. And I know right. this was really just scratching the surface, but so I, I have people do some different balance beam stuff with like, you know, the balance beam is broken up and they're on a soft surface or on a hard surface or on those things. So just to kind of make it a little bit, this is taking a next a step further with making sure that yeah. they have at least their socks on. Very cool. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, ideally. Mm-hmm. Lots of uh, lots of information. We could be on for like another forty minutes, forty five minutes. <laughs> yes, um, for sure. This is some really cool stuff, and I, like I said, I think um, two things about it. Um, I think, you know, like you said in, in your beginning of your lecture, it's very, uh, a lot of people are talking about the same things, you know, total body movements, you know, uh, uh, breathing, um, uh, mobility, uh, working, you know, barefoot, you know, so there's a lot of right. these and, you know, going back to like animal flow type movements, um, there's a lot of these similar themes and I think these when you're doing some of these different rest postures and, and some of the different things that you're suggesting, uh, it, it, they're just, they're very easy homework as well. Yes. Um, so yes. really interesting. I'll remind everybody you can go on body by Bible online to see the lecture. It's three parts, uh, about two hours. Um, and on strengthcoach.com, we posted an article, um, uh, Anna's article basically uh, going over the 12, how in tune is your body going over those 12 rest postures and her little scoring system and talking a little bit more about uh, about the feet um, um, and a couple of other different, uh, like the Japanese sit with quad massage and lowering into a toe sit. Those videos are on there. So Anna, thank you so much for uh, for coming on and uh, and talking all about this. A lot of talk right now on strengthcoach.com and I'm sure Coach Boyle is going to uh, really experiment with this and, and, and uh, we'll be talking about it on the podcast as well uh, in the months to come. Yeah, thank you. I, uh, it's my pleasure to share the work. So I'm, I'm happy to be be here. 
All right, well, that's going to do it for episode 177 of the Shrank Coach Podcast. Special thanks to Chris Parr, Aaron McGurr, and the folks over at Perform Better. You can check them out at performbetter.com for all their products and info on their educational seminars. Don't forget the big holiday sale going on now. Thanks to Coach Boyle and Anna Hartman for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of strength conditioning and performance enhancement. Alan Cosgrove for the Results Fitness University. Business of Fitness Sigma. Check them out at resultsfitnessuniversity.com. Frank Dolan and Functional Movement Systems. Check them out at functionalmovement.com. Kier Wenham Flat for his insights into the art of coaching with Exos. Check them out at teamexos.com forward slash hashtag education. Audible.com is giving Strength Coach Podcast listeners a special offer. To download your free audio book today, go to freebookfromant.com. Again, that's freebookfromant.com for your free audio book. And of course, remember, you can join strengthcoach.com and have access to the site for $1. That's three days, just a buck. Once your three-day trial is over and you become a member, you'll be able to download Coach Boyle's two books, Designing Strength Training Programs and Facilities, as well as Advances in Functional Training. And remember, if you have a staff of two or more and you want to sign up as a group, we have a special membership offer for you up to 50% off. Check that out at strengthcoach.com. To access that offer, you can click the Join Now button to get started on your trial. My name is Anthony Renna, and you can reach me at strengthcoachpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again, and I'll speak to you next time.